All right, hello again, APE Con. Here we've got uh, our micro unit four review. So last time, unit three, remember we covered uh, mostly cost curves, but then the big thing was getting into our first type of market, which is perfect competition. Unit four, we're talking about the other three types of competition. And so we got monopoly and all the nuances that come with monopoly, um, monopolistic competition, and then oligopoly. And so remember, as always, you see in this on YouTube, um, in the description, you can see uh, the times that each of the concepts are covered, and it's also going to be in this document as we've done before. But first, let's start, of course, with our characteristics of monopoly. Okay, a couple things. You usually have four things. There's only really three things to mention here. The first one is how many firms there are. Well, of course, monopoly is there's only one firm, so there's a single seller of a good or a service. Number two, uh, there are complete barriers to entry. Remember, perfect competition had many, many sellers and easy entry and exit. It was easy to get out of these markets, not so with Monopoly. In fact, there's something that makes it so that there's only one player involved. And it's usually one of three things. Sometimes it's ownership of resources. Sometimes there's only one person that owns a particular resource. And so if you want that resource, you have to go to them. That can happen. Oftentimes it's economies of scale that the item or whatever it is has to be produced on such a large scale, it only makes sense for one person to do it. Uh, we've talked about this before, utilities like the water company, right? Um, you know, think about, you know, uh, uh, we, water company has to run pipes to and from every single house in an entire city. If I wanted to set up a competing water company, I would have to build a separate facility with a second set of pipes running to and from every single house in a city, that just doesn't make sense, okay, to do that. I wouldn't be able to compete with that because my overhead costs would be so high when the system's already set up, I could not possibly do that. So economies of scale and sometimes government regulations. Sometimes the government says this is the only one that's allowed to do a particular thing. Like I think we've talked about it before, you know, the paper that our currency is printed on, there's only one company that's allowed to make that paper for obvious security reasons. They only want one, they don't want many companies making this paper. So uh, sometimes it's a government thing. Um, and then the third thing is they are a price maker. Okay, so they, because they can set the output, because they're the only players in the game, they in a sense have control over the price. Whereas remember perfect competition, they have no control over price whatsoever. They have to take the market's price. All right, um, however, some people like to characterize monopoly unfairly and say, well, they can charge whatever they want. Well, to say they can charge whatever they want is to ignore the fact that they have a downward sloping demand curve. If they want to sell more, they do have to lower the price because people will find alternatives or do something else or simply not buy it. Um, the fourth uh, uh, characteristic that you usually mention with uh, these uh, f uh, types of markets is uh, whether their product is the same or differentiated. That doesn't really matter here because they're the only player in the game, so there's nothing to compare it to. Um, and the other thing about Monopoly, differentiating it from perfect competition, there's no long run scenario here. Remember, there's not, there's not competition pushing firms in or out, bringing that uh, price down to uh, break even, all that kind of stuff. We don't see that in Monopoly. So, that being said, let's take a look at our Monopoly graph. Now again, you might notice uh, compared to uh, the perfectly competitive f firm, a little bit different. Remember, the perfectly competitive firm has that horizontal demand curve. Well, here, the monopoly's demand curve is downward sloping. Why is it downward sloping? Very simply, the monopoly is the market. This is what a normal demand curve looks like in a regular market. And in this case, the monopoly is the market. So they face this downward sloping demand curve. Now, what's also unique, remember, in a perfectly competitive firm, demand equals marginal revenue. They're both horizontal for the firm and they're both the same curve. Here, the marginal revenue curve is below demand. And remember the reason for that, the reason is if the, the monopoly wants to sell more units, they have to lower the price. And essentially they have to lower the price for everybody. So by lowering the price to get that next customer to come in the door, all the other customers who are willing to pay a higher price, well now they're paying the same low price that the, the next guy is paying and so forth. And so bottom line is, you can look at the numbers, we've done the charts before and all that. Bottom line is your marginal revenue is gonna decline faster than your demand. That's an important difference, okay, between this and perfect competition. Okay, marginal revenue is below demand. Um, let's see, profit maximizing output is still MR equals MC, so that's not the issue. Uh, that's not that's something different. 
Now, FYI, on this curve, I wanted to give you the simplest one possible as I start my discussion here. We're missing one curve. Remember, we always want four curves to show everything you need to show. You need a demand curve to, sh to show what the price is going to be. You need an MR and an MC curve to show where your output's going to be, and then you're missing, we're missing one curve, and that's the ATC curve, because that tells you whether or not they're making profits. We'll put the ATC curve on there shortly. I just want you to see this as simply as possible to understand the nuances. So, uh, MR equals MC is still our rule. That determines our output, okay, here at QM. Now remember, if you were drawing the graph, and the good news for you all this year is you don't have to draw the graph. You may see this though, and that may trip you up, is a lot of times we are so tempted to find the price, go straight over from here, and say that is the price the monopoly is gonna charge. We know that's not the case. To find the price, because demand always determines price. To find the price, as you can see, we go up to the demand curve and over to find what your price is. So again, MR and MC determines profit maximizing output. You have to find what the price of that output is gonna be by going up to the demand curve and then coming over and that's gonna be your, your uh, price there. Okay, so that's important. To find price, you must go up to the demand curve. Now, one of the reasons we don't like monopoly as economists is, it be, is because it creates dead weight loss. All right, now remember, ideally, businesses always produce where supply meets demand. Now again, there's not a supply curve on here. For practical purposes, we can consider MC the same as supply, even though in monopoly, there really isn't technically a supply curve. But for practical purposes, that, that represents the same thing. So ideally, the business would be producing right here at QE at a price of PE. Okay, that would be, if life were perfect, that's where the market would be, the market's not there. You will notice that the monopoly charge uh, uh, produces a lesser quantity than would be produced in the market and charges a higher price than would be produced in the market. And so this triangle right here becomes our that's right, dead weight loss. Okay, so that's why we don't like monopoly in the sense that they're not as efficient as perfectly competitive firms because you have this dead weight loss involved because of the control they have over the market. Okay, so um, they state this different ways. Okay, they're, they're not allocatively efficient. Sometimes it will be stated that way. They like to say it this way as well. The point at which they produce, the price is higher than the marginal revenue. Okay, so because price is up here, I'm sorry, marginal cost, because price is up here and marginal cost is down here. Does that say marginal revenue? Because it shouldn't, yeah, it says marginal cost, okay. Um, they're not gonna be producing the uh, socially optimal amount. In other words, demand's not gonna meet supply, okay? So uh, they're not that and uh, they charge, uh, they uh, produce a lower output and charge a higher price than we would normally see, okay? So it's a little bit inefficient in that sense. Uh, real quick, just to show you the profit and loss scenarios. So this is where we're adding that ATC curve back in so we can determine profit and loss. So remember our formula for profit. Profit is important. It's price minus ATC times quantity, right? Well, that's essentially what we do with this box right here. Where's our price? So again, where's our output? MR and MC intersects right here. So QF is how much the monopoly is going to produce. That's profit maximizing. How do we find price? That's right, we go up to demand, and this becomes our price, right, PF. So how do we apply our formula? Price, which is right here, minus ATC, so we go down to our ATC curve at this uh, level of output, and we multiply it by quantity. In other words, the area of this box right here represents price minus ATC times quantity, which represents how much profit they're making. Now, you know they're making profit because price is above ATC. As long as the price you're getting is greater than what it costs on average to make, you make money. You like that, right? That's what we want. So price is up here, ATC is down here. In our loss situation, you notice it's the opposite. In this case, ATC is above the price. Okay, same, same uh, process, MR and MC, here's our quantity go up to demand to find the price, but the problem is ATC is above. It, yeah, we'd still do the same process to shade or highlight, right? Price minus ATC times quantity, okay? And this area is our area of loss, okay? And again, it would be a negative. The reason you know it'd be a loss is because we look at the formula. If the ATC is a bigger number than the price, right? If it's eight 
minus 10. 8 minus 10 is negative 2. Negative 2 times however many units you sell is going to be a negative number. That's how you know it's a loss. When it was the reverse, when the price was greater than the ATC, now we had a 10 minus 8, for example. That's a positive number. That means the profits are positive, right? So you have those. That's what a profit scenario looks like in a loss scenario. Okay, pretty simple. All right, now the whole elasticity thing. Remember, they love to ask this question. It's kind of their pet question, and it's asked over and over again in different ways. And here's our rule. As long as the marginal revenue curve is positive, demand is elastic. Now, you see this nice graph that I found? Okay, so here's your MR curve, this, this green curve right here. Okay, as long as it's positive up to this point right here, I like how they label this because this is perfect. This is the elastic region of demand. Now, what's the rationale for knowing that that's elastic? Well, remember our total revenue test. Total revenue says that anytime you want the lower price, because the lower price gets you greater total revenue, demand is elastic. And that's exactly what's happening here. Because as you lower the price, um, if MR is positive, lowering the price, okay, here, as long as MR is positive, your total revenue is going up, okay? So any point in this region, lowering the price increases total revenue because MR is positive. Now, after MR goes negative, crosses the x-axis and it goes negative, demand becomes inelastic because if you were to lower the price further with a negative additional revenue, it takes away from your total revenue, and your total revenue starts to go down, right? So it decreases total revenue. In this case, you would want the higher price. Lowering the price further, you lose revenue, you want the higher price. What's our total revenue test? Anytime you want the higher price, uh, demand must be inelastic. There is this one exact point um, where it hits the x-axis that it is unit elastic. Again, this is a great graph that I found that illustrates it perfectly. So. MR goes negative, any point beyond there, demand is um, inelastic, any point while it's positive, it is elastic. And I might have set up here somewhere, okay, yeah. So since monopolies produce where MR equals MC, and typically, I mean, it, it wouldn't hardly make sense otherwise, they're gonna be producing at a point where MR is positive, right? So let's say this is our MC curve, okay? MC's gotta be a positive, right? You're not gonna have a negative cost, that'd be I'm not going to say never, but it's really tricky to do. But MC is typically positive, right? So MC has to intersect MR at some point while MR is positive. So typically in a profit maximizing unregulated situation, you're going to find that uh, your demand is elastic in whatever region the monopoly is producing at. Okay, There can be some scenarios where they say, what if you're producing beyond this point, demand is inelastic, but typically wherever you're producing, it's going to be elastic in that range. All right. Last thing, oh no, two other things for Monopoly. Uh, the next one is what's called price discrimination. The idea of price discrimination, pretty simple. You charge everybody exactly what the product is worth to them. So imagine someone coming into your store and saying, hey, how much would you, what's the most you'd be willing to pay for this product? And this guy says, I'd pay $10 for that. All right, your price is $10. Next guy walks in, what's the most you would be willing to pay? I'd pay $6, okay, it's $6 for you. Next guy comes in, I pay $30, I really want it, okay, you pay $30. That's the uh, what price discrimination, perfect price discrimination would look like. Everybody pays exactly what they're willing to pay for it, okay? Now, three things have to be true in order to perfectly price discriminate. Number one, you must have monopoly power. If there are a lot of other competitors and you're charging people different prices, people don't like that typically, right? So if you're doing that and they have other alternatives, they're just going to go to the, your competitors and buy from them. So you kind of have to be the only player in the game in order to get away with this. Uh, second one, and this is easier said than done, you must be able to separate or differentiate people based on their demand. In other words, how do you know the first guy, he's willing to pay $10, the next guy's willing to pay six. You can ask them, good luck on them being honest, but there are ways companies have figured out broadly that they can separate into demand. This is where senior citizens get discounts, there are movie matinees, there are you know, things like that that they can, they can determine that during uh, uh, the day, on a weekday, um, if you can see a movie at that time, you can probably see a movie anytime. And so, uh, because your demand is very elastic, we're gonna lower the price. Remember, demand is elastic, you want the lower price? So, uh, you can see the, the movie anytime, we're gonna give you a lower price for a matinee. 
as opposed to somebody who works all week long, can only see movies uh, on nights or on weekends, right? Their demand is less elastic because they only have so much, so they raise the price because demand is more inelastic. So um, there are things you can do, but it's still easier said than done. And then of course, no resale. Because if there was resale, the person who gets it really cheap can buy it and then resell it to the person who really, really wants it, and they're not gonna buy it from Monopoly and then it doesn't really work. So those three characteristics generally need to be true. Here's the trick now. Let's say a Monopoly was able to do that and everybody literally paid exactly what it was worth to them. Well, if that happened, the demand curve would become the same as the marginal revenue curve because everyone pays exactly what it's, instead of one person uh, or one price being set for everybody, everyone pays exactly what it's worth. And now these curves would become the same. Good news, bad news. Good news. For us as economists, we like this because now if you produce where MR equals MC, and of course you always do, you will notice that you're essentially producing where supply meets demand. Okay, or MC, which is the same as supply, so no deadweight loss. We like that part of it. Here's the bad news, no consumer surplus. Remember, what is consumer surplus? It's the difference between what somebody is willing to pay or what something is worth to them and what they actually pay. If everyone pays exactly what it's worth to them, there's no additional or no bonus. They don't lose, but they trade $10 for a product that's worth an equal $10, okay? So consumers get zero surplus out of this situation. This whole area, if we were to shade it, would all be producer surplus, okay? Producers get it all because they get the benefit of charging everyone what it's worth to them. So that's the good news, bad news, good news. Um, no dead weight loss, we like that. Bad news, consumers get no surplus. So consumers aren't a big fan of this, okay? And then lastly, um, how, uh, since monopolies are inefficient naturally, sometimes the government says maybe we can improve the markets by regulating them or overseeing them or whatever. How do they do that? Usually there's two options. Again, this is another great graph um, that illustrates uh, the different points. So ideally, the government says, we want you to charge the socially optimal price. What is socially optimal? Same as allocative efficient. Okay, it means essentially you're producing where supply or MC hits demand. Okay, so the socially optimal price is where demand intersects marginal costs. Good news, no deadweight loss. The problem is, and this graph illustrates it perfectly, this can put the monopoly in a situation where they're losing money and it can push them out of business, right? Because notice, here's where they're producing. Of course, that's gonna be the price because that's where your demand is, right? Um, and their price is below average total cost. That's a loss situation. And sometimes, you know, uh, that's not cool. You can't put a company in a position where they're gonna be forced out of business, right? So they might say, all right, look, I know we can't make you charge socially optimal because you're gonna go out of business. Uh, do me this though, why don't you charge the fair return price? Okay, fair return price is where demand intersects ATC. In other words, break even, okay? so. If the price is the same as the ATC, that's your break-even scenario, and they don't make money. Remember, they, they're making normal accounting profit, okay, but they're not making economic profit. And so from the perspective of the government, so it's an improvement, okay, from, for, as far as markets are concerned. It's not, it's not perfect, but it's an improvement. Because remember, originally, essentially this was our deadweight loss, okay? This whole area in here now, if you make them charge the fair return price, dead weight loss shrinks to the green area. So it's a certainly a, a much better outcome than if nothing was done. Not, no regulation took place. Not as good as no dead weight loss, but definitely a lot better than the whole area. So remember those two uh, points, uh, socially optimal where demand hits marginal cost and fair return where demand hits ATC. Okay, and that's monopoly. All right, I believe we're on to monopolistic competition. And this is an easy one. You gotta know the, the definition, the characteristics. Other than that, the graph looks and works exactly the same as what we did with monopoly, with one small exception. There is a long run scenario that I will show you in just a moment. But uh, what do we got with monopolistic competition? Our characteristics, uh, many firms, okay? How many people are producing? You got many, okay? How many hundreds, maybe thousands? Not quite as few as perfect competition necessarily, but probably quite a few, okay? Dozens, hundreds, maybe. Um, easy entry and exit, easy to get in and out of these markets. Uh, this is key, similar but differentiated product. 
So the thing that all these companies are selling is, is whereas perfect competition, remember, is identical. No differentiation between one of the next homogenous. This one is, is pretty close, but there is some differentiation. Because of that, it gives them some control over price, okay? Best example, I think, of monopolistic competition is uh, restaurants, fast food places or whatever. Again, how many different places in town can you get a hamburger? Can you get a pizza, right? But not all hamburgers are the same. Certainly not all pizzas are the same. Some are better than others. Some are, are your favorites. Some not, you know. So there is some control over price because you can justify, yeah, my hamburger is a little bit more expensive, but it's better than that garbage my competitor is serving. So yes, I can charge a higher price and people are still gonna buy it. However, not a lot of control over price because there's so many others, right? So many other options, but there is some control. And there's also, because there are many firms and easy entry and exit, it does create a long run scenario. Same process as with perfect competition. What happens in perfect competition? Firms are making money, making profit. Oh, cool. Um, more firms are gonna enter and wanna do that. As more firms enter, it lowers the demand curve, lowers the price, and firms break even. Or firms losing money, okay, firms losing money, firms exit, as firms exit, supply shifts left, it raises price, raises the demand curve for the existing firms, brings them back to break even. It's really the same exact process, okay? They're not gonna ask you to graph it because it's kind of messy, but um, just to see it again, this is a situation with a firm earning profit, same as Monopoly, and you see the graph, looks identical to a Monopoly graph in, in almost every way. You might say the demand curve is more elastic than a Monopoly demand curve, that's splitting hairs, okay? They're probably not gonna nitpick like that, but they could. Uh, but anyway, so you got your demand curve, downward sloping, MR below demand, all that kind of stuff, MR, MC. Here's our profit scenario because price is greater than ATC. Here's our loss scenario where price is less than ATC. And in the long run, firms enter and exit. And this is what's unique to monopolistic competition compared to monopoly is there is a long run scenario where, again, MR and MC right here. So here's our quantity, come up here to find price. And you'll notice that price uh, is right here where ATC tangents the demand curve. And so there's this kind of um, sweet spot here where price and ATC are the same, and that means that they're breaking even. That's really the only nuance between monopolistic competition versus monopoly, other than, of course, the difference in definition. Um, but as far as the graph is concerned, that's the only difference. Otherwise, it would look the same, it would uh, interpret the same, all that kind of stuff. All right, uh, last type of market then, oligopoly. Uh, oligopoly characteristics, how many people are producing? You got a few big ones. You can have small ones. Uh, usually it's what, uh, we go with what's called the rule of 40. If the four largest firms have at least 40% market share, that's an oligopoly. Again, you think about cars are probably a good example. Uh, you've got kind of the big three, Ford, General Motors, Toyota, at least in this country. Um, they, they own a big share of the car market. There are others, there's Kia, there's you know all the others, but um, the, the biggest ones have the, have the big market share. Okay, cereal's another example. Go to any cereal aisle. Kellogg's and General Mills dominate the cereal aisle. Post will be in there a little bit, and then you have the store brands and whatnot, but um, most of it is, is the big guys. So, uh, oligopoly, uh, there are significant barriers to entry. Something, there's some reason why there's not a lot of firms in these markets, usually economies of scale. Usually you have to produce on such a large scale that it's just hard for the little guy to, to get in there and, and make a difference or have a presence. The product itself can be homogenous or differentiated. Cars are a little bit different, obviously. Toyota's not the same as what Ford's making, not the same as what GM's making. Uh, but with something like steel, there are a few big steel producers, and generally steel is steel, right? So it can be either. The thing that really separates oligopoly from the others is what we call, of course, interdependent pricing, because there are so few. What one company does has a big effect on the other companies and what they do. And this is what creates our game theory matrix, okay, that we're gonna look at next. All right, so here's a classic example of a game theory matrix. And so again, once you know how to read this, this is a very black and white, very uh, uh, pretty straightforward concept here. So again, what I like to do if I was doing this, if I was giving this as a, say, a free response question, I like to take uh, prisoner B or take one of them, maybe put a box around it and then put a box around uh, prisoner B's outcomes. It just helps visually 
you to see the difference between, okay, you're talking about prisoner B or prisoner A, that can be confusing. But here's how you read this, okay? So prisoner A, these guys get caught by the police and they have two options, either confess or deny, not confess, right? So prisoner A is looking at it, he says, hmm, what if my partner confesses? If my partner confesses, my options are to confess, in which case my outcome, we both confess, my outcome is five years in prison. If, I, if my partner confesses and I deny though, I get 10 years in prison. So from pr prisoner A's perspective, if he thinks his partner's gonna confess, he is better off confessing because five years is a better outcome than 10 years. So I'm gonna put a little, I like to put a little star there to know that that's something that prisoner A might like to do. Now, you can also say, hmm, what if, what if my partner denies it? Then what are my options? Well, if he denies it, my options are to confess, and if he denies and I confess, I get one year, or I can also deny and get two years. Well, between one year or two years, one year is a better outcome, so if I think he's gonna deny, I'm also going to confess, and now we have what we consider to be a dominant strategy. In other words, regardless of what prisoner B does, whether he confesses or denies, it's always in prisoner A's best interest to confess. That's his dominant strategy. For prisoner B, of course, it's the same numbers but in reverse, so it's gonna end up being the same thing. If prisoner A confesses, he can either confess and get five years or deny and get 10 years. He'd much rather confess and get five. If prisoner A denies, he can confess and get one year or deny and get two years. He'd rather get one year than two, so he also, has the dominant strategy to confess. And you can see all those numbers right here, okay, just kind of put out there. So the way we look at this, we'd say, all right, if they don't cooperate, we can predict what's going to happen. Prisoner A is gonna say, well, no matter what my partner does, I confess. Prisoner B is gonna say the same thing, and they're both gonna end up serving five years in prison. Now, one of the things with monopoly, or I'm sorry, with oligopoly is what's called Collusion. Collusion is this idea that, hey, maybe we can work together and get a better outcome. Because if we know that we're both going to end up confessing and getting five years, hey, let's really not confess. Let's both deny, because if we both deny, we're only going to end up with two years in prison. Okay? And that's possible, and there are times where oligopolies try to do this. They try to get together and either... Uh, manipulate price or manipulate output or whatever in order to try to get themselves a better outcome. The only trick is, do you really trust your partner that he is going to deny? Or do you think to yourself, man, um, he might look at this and say, Shh, I, can, I know my partner is going to deny. I'm going to cheat and confess and knock a year off my sentence. And then there's kind of this temptation to cheat. And a lot of times these uh, agreements, whatever, they break down because well, the, the temptation is there, okay? But that's what collusion would look like. Is there a better outcome uh, that they can get to, okay? And so that's how you would read an oligopoly a game theory matrix, okay? So monopoly, monopolistic competition, game theory, those are the big concepts that you're gonna be asked about, the big nuances. As always, if you have any questions about specifics, let me know. And of course, till next time.